what, what has been the issue on third down specifically this year? Uh, it seems like it's been a problem, uh, not necessarily on the early downs defensively, but uh, later downs. It's a little bit of everything, you know. It's um, it's been leverage. It's been a little bit of execution, a little bit of communication at times, you know. So uh, it's got to be better. It's got to be better in every way. And uh, if that means improving our technique, drilling it better, absolutely, that's part of it. And then um, the calls are part of it too, you know. So I got to continue to try to find um, the best ways to utilize the the current guys that we have, you know, and and play to their strengths because ultimately that's what it what it comes down to. It's not necessarily my system or their system or Saul's system. It's the system that's right for these guys, you know. So um, we're learning each other, and it's uh, it's going to improve. How do you uh, work on that, like throughout throughout the season? I think you just you, you observe and you and you watch and and uh, and as we learn our players better, you start to really learn their strengths and you learn their weaknesses. So you learn what to lean on, you learn what to avoid. You know, so it's a little bit all that. Um, you know. Uh, uh, Belichick has said that a lot of times. You know, he doesn't know who his team is until sometimes halfway through the season. And, and once you find out who they are and you, you learn their strengths, then, and then we're rolling. And we go in that direction, the direction of the players. With the third down thing, I think it's particularly been an issue in the first quarter of the last couple of games. Do you see any reason for that from your standpoint? You know, like for this last game, you know, just because it's the freshest on my mind right now, you know, we started with a more of a man mentality and um, and it wasn't working like we thought it would work and we thought it was a good plan, you know, but uh, I credit our staff and I credit the players that we um, we changed course, you know, and, and we went into more of a, a zone mentality and it was uh, and it was better. Still not good enough, but it was better. You, um, you, you mentioned the Bill Belichick and how you kind of figure it out sometimes halfway through the year. Um, he obviously had you know, Tom Brady and some players there that allowed him to you know, maintain through those eight games and, and not fall too far behind. So when they did figure it out, they really took off. Right. Do you feel any pressure to, to figure it out earlier and, and sooner just because you know, this is a young team that doesn't necessarily have that experience to, to win back from? Yeah, I mean, you always feel pressure, you know, like that's the name of this business. Um, it's about performance and results. And, uh, and when they're not what they need to be and what they should be, then, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of pressure to get that right. Uh, fortunately, we have a group of players that is just, um, it's the best collective unit I've been around from the standpoint of uh, they are not okay with this. And we're not okay with this as a coaching staff. And we're both putting in um, every single uh, imaginable resource to fix it and get it right and get it better. And uh, and uh, I, I really believe that's going to come to fruition this week. I do. Yeah. What's your, what was your take on, on Quinn and, and Aaron and, and how that unfolded? And how did you handle that on your end? Yeah, two extremely passionate, fiery guys that love this game and love winning and love competing and, and – um, and when you have guys that are built that way, which I think winning organizations and, and championship organizations, you need those type of people, coaches and players alike. Um, there's times where that gets heated, and 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 it comes from a, a good place. You know, it's it's uh, it's something that we don't want to happen, obviously, but. Uh, but when it does happen, it's not rooted in selfishness. It's not rooted in my way, your way. It's not rooted in, um, you know, in anything from a negative perspective. It's just two guys that love this game and love ball and, and want the, the best for this organization, want the best for this team, want the best for their teammates, you know. And, and sometimes it bowls over a little bit. Quinn actually seemed like he was a little surprised at himself when we talked about the game because he is usually got the smile on his face all the time and whatnot. You know, did that take you a little bit by surprise that he got – not that fiery, um, you know, even though it, despite the competitor he is, but he's usually kind of the, you know, smiling, laughing. Right, maybe a little bit, you know, maybe a little bit, but I've, I've seen that fire in him before, you know, whether it be practice or there's been times in games where that's, that's come out, not necessarily in that demonstrative way, but um, he is an extremely passionate guy. I think sometimes... Um, he doesn't necessarily want the, the limelight on himself, so he doesn't have the big personality, like, look at me, I'm the big rah-rah guy pounding my chest. He's, he's more of, I'm going to demonstrate my, through my actions. And, um, and it, was, it was an unfortunate thing that, uh, you know, I, I can't promise you it won't happen again, you know, but it was, I promise this, it came from two guys that are made of the right stuff that just, it was a byproduct of their passion and wanted to do right and be successful. Obviously, you guys are very much listeners on your own. Yes, absolutely. Did you feel like he had a point at, at that moment? 
Um, yeah, like we had had a conversation prior to that conversation that was fiery, you know, not as fiery, but um, absolutely. A, a, a player like Quinnen, who's not only, you know, he's an incredible player, he's got a great football acumen and he's, and he's a very intelligent player person player and uh, and he understands this game you know so he's a guy in the trenches he's in the fire he's in the mix um, you know and and uh, we definitely listen and we definitely took into consideration what he said and and uh, we adapted it as we went throughout the game uh, and partly because of the feedback he gave us fire and passion aside he was essentially questioning the call probably later after the game and so how do you feel about it as the guy who made the call no, it wasn't necessarily a question of the call. It was just the... Well, he didn't like the seven-man rush there. Yeah, he just wanted less pressuring. He wanted more four-man rush, you know, which um, I've been around a lot of really good D-linemen playing and, and coaching alike, and, and uh, that's what you want from them. You know, you want them to say, we can take care of this. You guys cover. We'll handle the rush. We'll get after this quarterback. And, and, uh, and there, I think there's a time and place for both, you know, and me and... Q have had that conversation, and, and we'll continue to educate each other on on what's best for this defense. There seemed to be a lot of frustration too because DJ Reed after the game spoke about wanting to meet with the coaches and like hash out right. all the communication right. issues. Has anything happened along those lines, or have you spoken to him? Has he spoken up to you guys? No, we, I mean we've had a lot of conversations, and and uh, another comment that comes from the greatest place imaginable. You know, I've been around a lot of places where. Uh, there's frustrations, there's um, lack of success, and there was a lack of caring, and there was a lack of, of wanting to get it right, and things didn't change because of that. I think because of the, uh, the makeup of the men that we have within this defense that uh, we will get it right. You know, um, you got coaches that are committed to it, you got players that are committed to it, and I think re really DJ, all he's saying is we're going to do everything imaginable to get this thing right. Um, do mistakes, the communication errors happen sometimes, especially sometimes early in the season? They do. Are they okay? Absolutely not. You know, so we gotta we gotta continue to work on the communication, the execution, and uh, and the third down for sure. What happened on the chase touchdown? It just it was it was a communication breakdown. That can't happen. You know, it can't happen. And I put that on myself too much. Defense obviously, and they're speaking to me through that. So um, I will adapt and I will make sure that uh, that we are better in that way. How would you evaluate how the, your safeties have been playing three games? I think all of us have had glimpses of what we'll be. We had glimpses of what we can be, and we've also had glimpses of times where we're we're not good enough collectively, coaching players alike at all positions, at all levels of our defense. So um, we're gonna we're gonna like it. We we are gonna we are tireless right now from a working standpoint, player um, and coaches. We've. Uh, I think we've addressed some things. I think we've definitely um, identified some things that we can we can improve, and we've uh, we've shown a light on them this week. And um, this Sunday, it's I'm I'm excited for us to to demonstrate all this work. The communication errors they seem to have come at inopportune times, or at least you've been getting you know burned for them. Why why do you think that's happening, and how do you kind of you know make sure that they're not happening in these situations where it ends up being super costly? Yeah, the the whenever it's a red zone breakdown, especially from a communication standpoint, the the byproduct of a of a mistake in the red zone is a touchdown. You know, so it's a place where you got to speed your mind up down there, and those uh, those errors can occur. The communication errors they can occur. Um, so is it? It's improving what we're doing for sure, and then it's also maybe doing a little bit less. You know, until we get to the place where we've mastered what we have. You know, so. Uh, We'll keep going forward with that with that approach. From the pass rush, it looked like you guys were getting around Joe. It just you weren't bringing him down. So yeah. What is the the coaching point when your guys are there? It's just not not finishing. Yeah, it's it's just getting off blocks and finishing on the quarterback. You know, we we had some good rushes, we had some good wins, we had some good pressure, we had him off the spot uh, multiple times. Now we just got to finish him. You know, and. Uh, you know, that's that's us doing a better job, and it's also giving credit to the quarterback who uh, he's one of the better ones at evading it, you know, and, and seeing the rush. You know, he's one of those rare guys that, I, you know, I don't coach quarterbacks, but they've always taught to, to see downfield and don't see the rush. He's a guy that's built the other way a little bit. He he sees the rush. He's very aware of the rush, but he, he uses his uh, vision of the rush to evade it, and then when he evades it, he gets his eyes back up the field, you know, which is a rare uh, skill set for a quarterback. 
when you are, are preparing for a team like Pittsburgh, I know they they're, they're committed to Mitch, and they've said they're committed to Mitch. Yep. But they've got the rookie first round pick behind them, and they've, they've dealt with some offensive struggles early here. Do you need to prepare for for Pickett as well, just in, in case there is a quarterback switch? I mean, we're aware, I think, you know, collectively as a, as a defensive staff, what he does well. Um, but I don't think from a schematic standpoint that they would be this wholesale change. You're talking about one guy changing and then 11 guys having to do something completely different. So um, I do think there are different strengths, different weaknesses to the quarterbacks that we have to be aware of just in case there is that switch and uh, have, a, have a good understanding of how um, he'll attack us, and what are his best throws, and what are throws that he or coverages that he potentially struggles with, you know. But from a schematic standpoint, I don't think there'll be a whole lot different between the two. What do you see from this offense is different than the first three teams you played from right. an explosiveness standpoint? Right. Obviously, they're still fun. It's uh, it's an interesting challenge, you know. Like, um, it's been a very strange first three weeks of a season because you start with Baltimore that's all over the place you know they're um, all this quarterback run game and this exotic gap schemes and and then you go to Cleveland who's a smash mouth team like a a team that kind of a throwback in a lot of ways and then this team has a they got a lot of uh, variety with their offensive uh, playbook and a lot of stuff that you don't see on a regular basis so it's uh it's, it's definitely ruling up some concepts and some different things that, that you don't see in the NFL a whole lot. So it's a, it's a different challenge in that way. With Quinn and, you know, and this is, I guess, symptomatic of the defensive tackle position, but a lot of times the stats aren't there in terms of the stats that fans pay attention to, like sacks and stuff like right. that. But can you just explain how important he is to your defense and what exactly he does that maybe isn't showing up on the stat sheet? Yeah, he is, and I've said this before, he just, I think, has, like, real game record to him. You know, I think he's a problem in the run game. He can be extremely disruptive there. He's been, he's been extremely disruptive there. Um, even when he's not making the play, he's eating double teams, and he's, he's getting knocked back, and he's, and he's creating penetration, and he's, um, he's doing an excellent job from that standpoint. And from a rush perspective, I really believe, like, you have to account for him. And that's a rare thing for an internal guy like that. Edge guys, you can chip, you can turn protection, you can do a lot of things to help. Internal guys, it's, it's harder. It's why I think that there's sometimes um, there's even more value to a really good inside rusher, and I think he has that uh, capability. Just got to continue to get him more opportunities, and uh, and a big part of that is is winning on third down. The more, the better he does on third down, the better we'll do collectively on third down. Jeff, I think a couple more. I, I know you guys you guys use that uh, rotation on the D-line, obviously everybody's shuffling in and out, but when you have someone playing as well as Quinn and is, like you're saying, is there any thought to keeping the hot hand out there kind of thing, letting him get more snaps? Uh, that is the instinct, for sure. Yeah. You know, there's like these critical moments in game and, and, and why is Quinn not out there? You know, and you look to the side and he's gasping for air, you know, so just got to be judicious with it. Um, got to absolutely use him as much as we can and as much as we can in critical moments, for sure, you know, but I still think there has to be a level of rotation. He plays at such a high clip and he goes so hard that um, sometimes more is less or more isn't necessarily as good because now you're, you're not seeing the speed, the explosiveness, all the, the special stuff from an athletic standpoint that he brings. Without Quincy out there, what do Quan and Marcel bring to fill in that spot? Uh, I, Quan brings um, I, obviously Quincy has tremendous speed. That's that's hard to replicate. But Quan brings a different level of experience and uh, and communication and a guy that's just you know he's got more years doing it. You know, but um, both bring tremendous value. Um, but uh, Quan will bring something unique and special too. So excited for him to get his op to to start here and play more. Jeff, even though he's on the other side of the ball, and in the summer you're evaluating your guys, but with, with Max Mitchell, who you know, was not a, not a high draft pick, right. um, were there moments in training camp when you're on the other side of the ball and watching stuff going on to think that this guy maybe has a little something more than fourth round draft pick. Yeah, I, you saw tons of glimpses of it. Obviously, from an athletic standpoint, he's a big man. Um, and when you find out that he's over 300 pounds, because you don't look it because he's built so well, um, you know, he, he definitely, he checks all those physical boxes, the movement, the, but then when you get to know him, like he's got rare uh, poise and command and confidence for a young guy, you know, especially for a young guy that wasn't drafted, drafted necessarily very high. So, um, yeah, I think he has a, a tremendous future in this league. I really do. I think he's got the right makeup to be a really good tackle.